You might have thought that no one who has ever stepped on a Lego brick could possibly doubt the reality of physical objects. Yet, from Heraclitus to Berkeley, many philosophers have claimed to have disproven that uh, mind-independent things exist. Could the world truly be made up of fields and processes rather than physical stuff? Are the everyday objects that surround us an illusion? Or is science in a philosophical fantasy which needs escape? Or are these all completely the wrong questions in the first place? That's what we will find out from our panel, Peter Atkins, James Ladyman, Joanna Cavenna. Um, I won't give them detailed introductions because we're short of time and you can find out more about them in the programme. We want to know what they think. We're going to start with three-minute opening positions, which they'll set out their broad stalls, um, with the very broad question, are everyday objects around us illusory? Peter. Mm. Well, I'd hope you'd go for a longer introduction to give me time to think. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I intend to um, take an extreme view, which I will uh, attempt to defend against all opposition throughout the, this debate. If there is any opposition, of course, it might be accepted immediately. Um, but, and uh, it's up to you to judge whether I, I'm actually pretending to adopt this or whether I really believe it, <laughs> or whether I'm really pretending to pretend, <laughs> etc. And I'm, I'm going to take the view that ultimate reality is mathematics. Uh, that everything that there is, is somehow or other, and I, I will have to explore what I mean by somehow or other, uh, simply a kind of realisation of mathematics. And I think it, the clue to why I think that is that mathematics is such an important component of our description of physical reality. It's, it's extraordinary that mathematics proves to be the language, turns out to be the language of, um, of discovery and, uh, and comprehension, if you like, in the, in the physical sciences. Why does mathematics suit so well the, the physical reality that we uh, seem to encounter. And there are all sorts of analogies between um, physical reality and, um, and mathematics. I mean, think of the integers. Uh, well, once you've got the integers, as Kredaka said, um, that the rest is doing things, mathematics is doing things to the integers that they weren't intended to in the first place. And out of that springs the, the whole of the construct of mathematics and all its elaborate forms. Um, but where do the integers come from? They come from the empty set and sets that contain the empty set and so on. So you can build up an, an idea of the integers from absolutely nothing. And this world, of course, sprang from absolutely nothing. So there are deep analogies, I think, between the emergence of this elaborate world and the emergence of an elaborate mathematical structure. But then somehow or other, and maybe this will unfold in the course of our discussion, uh, we've got to find out what it means for tangible objects to uh, be manifestations of mathematical entities. Thank you. There's a, a lot to unpick there. I hope we get to unpick at least some of it. Um, James. Right, so I want to begin by saying that there are some things that we can see which aren't real and some things that are real that we can't see. I think both those statements are pretty obvious, but just to give you an uh, example. And this will make the distinction between an illusion and something subjective or private to imaginary to me. Take a rainbow. Why isn't a rainbow real? Well, for a very long time, people have thought, to be real, it's not enough that everyone agrees that they can see something there. The point about a rainbow is that you can only perceive it through vision. So it's a public illusion. Everybody sees it, but you can only see it through, only encounter it through vision. It's not possible to bump into a rainbow or hear a rainbow, encounter a rainbow in any other way than through this one sense. And so it's right to distinguish between a rainbow and the table is the table, although I might think, okay, I get limited information about it by seeing it, but I can also bump into it and I can also weigh it and other, pe other people bump into it and encounter it as well. 
So with that distinction in mind, the distinction between an illusion and uh, what's, what's private, and also just to establish that there are things that we can see that aren't real, like rainbows, we also need to admit that there are things that are real that we can't see, such as, for example, electromagnetic radiation outside the visual, spe visual spectrum, uh, visible spectrum. We all know that that radiation is there because we get our mobile phone signals, right? We all know that diseases that we can't see can kill us. We know that radiation that we can't see can kill us. So there are definitely things that exist that common sense doesn't tell us anything about and which we wouldn't know existed if we hadn't done further investigation. And so in general, we shouldn't think that common sense is a particularly good guide to what there is. Now, science tells us about loads of things that exist. And um, I don't want to go on for too long at this point. I'll have some more to say later. But I would say that really we don't need to put the issue in terms of everyday things versus subatomic particles or fields or whatever. We can put the issue in terms of scientific kinds that aren't fundamental and particles or fields or whatever. So let's just think about Peter's subject matter in chemistry, molecules, those things are not fundamental in science. They're higher level entities. There are lots of things like that that science studies. Um, big entities that are nonetheless real, physical you might say, but not the ultimate fundamental stuff is if there is any such thing. So if we're going to deny the existence of everyday things just because they're not fundamental, then we need to deny the existence of lots of scientific kinds as well, which I don't think is a sensible thing to do because these are part of what we've learned to take account of in order to understand the world in the same way that we have to take account of, of tables. So, uh, short answer is yes, there are lots of physical things that uh, we only know about through science and there are some things that we encounter in common sense that aren't real, but lots of things that are. It's a very uh, sort of commonsensical position, but. I think important to note that it's common sense to think that in the light of the development advanced science that tells us that there's lots of stuff like microwaves that we otherwise wouldn't know about. And so it wouldn't have been common sense to think what I think uh, you know, in previous ages, it just is now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Joanna. Thank you very much. Um, so this is a kind of really interesting question which has this huge history behind it as we've been hearing. And if you think of philosophy as a kind of boxing match, why not? Um, in, the, in the sort of red corner, there are the physicalists, the materialists who you know, adopt the view that the physical world is what we can be sure of, the stuff that we can kind of be sure of, look at, make sense of. Um, and you have Johnson in refutation of Berkeley, you know, I've kicked the stone, my foot hurts, that kind of refutation. Um, and then in the sort of blue corner, you have the idealist tradition, the anti-materialist tradition, this idea that really you can be sure only of your mind, that's the thing you're sure of. And everything else is a bit dodgy, potentially. And this goes back to the ancient Eastern traditions, the Upanishads, where creation begins with I am. That's the first kind of moment in creation, and then the world. Um, and also Berkeley's kind of idea, which we now see as subjective idealism, this idea that for him it was a kind of, it was a synthesized reality because of God, you know, because of the mind of God perceiving everything, so it was all okay. You can then kind of start playing with that if you're Borges, for example, um, the great sort of uh, writer of the 20th century who had this idea, if you don't have God anymore in that tradition, what happens? And he had a short story called Talon Ukbar, Tertius Orbis, where he imagines if subjective reality is the only thing then the danger is that this tent would disappear if someone wasn't looking at it and it would be a real problem and so entire civilizations have been saved by a flock of birds flying past just at the right moment that kind of idea so you know you can have a lot of fun with the extremities of these theories um, and physicalism gets into terrible trouble with the self this problem if because you can't find a physical thing called the self it doesn't exist and you get the sort of arch physicalist view that the self is an illusion which leads to that wonderfully mad sentence I myself believe there is no self which you know causes all sorts of fascinating problems of how a non-existent self can refute its own reality so I think you know it's a really fascinating question at the risk of sounding like I want to stop the boxing match which is you know I, I, I don't at all um, asking the pugilists to be friends I think there's also one further point that I'd like to make about this, irrespective of whether we're going to arrive at a sense of the truth of everything now at this moment, which I fear we may not. There is this possibly uh, a fact that we might all accept, which is that we're all having a subjective experience. We're all here 
as a unique human seeing the world. And so our experience is always mediated through the self. So you never escape that. Even in the most beautiful science, there's always a perceiver doing the perceiving. There's always someone there. And that's kind of the uh, sort of interim position I'd like to take. Thank you. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.